Welcome to the Virtual Bite of Science for Southern California. So thrilled that you can all join us today and take some time out of your busy schedules. And I know because you guys are probably very tired of the virtual. So super excited to have you all here. A little bit about the Center for Excellence in Education. We were founded in 1983 by Joanne DiGennaro and Admiral Rickover, father of the nuclear Navy and civilian uses of nuclear power. Our mission is to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in STEM and offer three cost-free programs uh, in the United States, which are the Research Science Institute, USA Bio-Olympiad, and Teacher Enrichment Program. And if you've joined us before, this is probably pretty familiar. Um, so we run the Research Science Institute, which is a highly competitive six-week summer science and engineering program open to rising high school seniors. It combines on-campus coursework in science theory with off-campus work in, um, in science and technology research. Participants go on to do well at um, Regeneron, ISEF, uh, and Siemens competitions, and many go on to advanced STEM degrees. Um, we also have the USA Bio-Olympiad, Bio or USABO, which is actually open to any high school student. Um, and it's just a series of examinations testing knowledge of biology concepts. Um, our... The top 20 attend national finals, um, and then the top four from that go on to the International Bio Olympiad, uh, which will be virtual this year. Also unfortunate because it's supposed to be in Portugal. And then we have a variety of free student and teacher resources that are great for AP and IB biology preparation. So then we have TEP, uh, which is what we're here for. Uh, TEP provides opportunities for middle and high school uh, science teachers. Uh, to connect with experts in industry and academia, um, explore some cutting edge research and development in STEM, especially as it seems to, the advancement seems to be accelerating, and hopefully make some meaningful professional links uh, with direct benefits to you and your students. Um, this year, we're going, we went virtual. Also spent a whole bunch of time this fall reorganizing our lab bench and have a new website. And then it's, we call it public-private partnerships, um, but it's pretty much just if you need a speaker, or you're looking for someone to tell you about some content knowledge, um, just get in touch with me. I'm happy to see who I can connect you with. I'm gonna go. There we go. Um, and this is what the new, our new website and lab bench look like. So we have, um, they're organized by tab at the top. So we have life sciences, design, engineering, physical sciences, technology, and math. Uh, some webinars in digital learning and some additional resources. Within those, they are broken up into uh, more specific topics to help you guys find what you're looking for. And if there's any ever any resources that you can't find or don't know where to look for, let me know. I'm actually really good at finding lesson plans and resources. And I'm really, really excited today to welcome um, Dr. C.Y. Daniel Lee, who's adjunct prof assistant professor at the Center for Neurobehavioral Genetics and Semmel Institute, and I think I just said that wrong, for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA. And Michael Haro, uh, Environmental Engineer, Senior Staff, Advanced Del Development Program from Lockheed Martin. And with that, Daniel, it's all you. Thank you, and thanks everyone for having me here. Uh, I'm very glad to be able to share um, what my um, passion and what our um, findings for, for our research. My name's Daniel. D, and uh, I'm an assistant professor in um, UCLA. Today I'm going to talk about basically, uh, hopefully I can go through these two parts. One, the first part will be um, the, uh, our research on Alzheimer's disease. And um, I think um, most of you or not, if not everyone knows about the Alzheimer's disease, it, which is uh, um, it's a very devastating disease. And it's a, it's a it's a majority of the dementia in the elderly are Alzheimer's patients. And I would like to share um, first the quote um, uh, by Auguste Dieter. Uh, she said, I have lost myself, so to say. This is her response to the questions um, to her when she was asking um, multiple questions re repeatedly about what she has been doing and then she could not remember. And it was in her early 50s. She is the first um, Alzheimer patient being described. She sent, uh, she sent to uh, Dr. Alois Alzheimer in 1901 at the time. And then she, as I said, she was in her early 50s. So it, it is actually pre dementia at the time. And it was very, 
um, fascinating to Dr. Alzheimer. And he, um, he examined her and then, and then keep seeing her over years. And eventually she died at uh, 1906. And she's, uh, Dr. Alzheimer saw her um, disease progress very fast during those uh, five years. After her death, her um, brain has been um, dissected. This is not her brain, but um, I just want to show you is how Alzheimer brain look like. And then this is a, a normal brain look like. So the normal brain, you can see it's very, um, well, compared to normal brain, you can see a lot of like grooves, which is meaning there are um, atrophies in the brain. And then if you have a, a like a big sections on cutting this way, and then you can see that the, uh, the gray matter where our, the neurons are, are uh, severely uh, declined, especially in the region which um, help you to memorize things, the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex area. And um, the pathological characteristics of Alzheimer's is what we call the plaques and the tangles. These are the deposition of, um, of a protein called uh, beta amyloid protein. And um, they, they form this kind of like deposition because they aggregate outside of the cells and then form the plaques. And then also these, uh, it's also inter uh, affects normal neuronal function and then forms these kind of tangles, which is also another protein called tau. Tau aggregates inside the neurons. And as you can see, this kind of black or we say dark neurons because they are not healthy at the time. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is, um, majority of them are sporadic, a very low percentage, um, less than 5% actually is the one to, most likely one to 2% are familial. The, um, the way we call it familial, meaning they are um, purely genetic disease. They, <clears throat> if you have a mutation of certain gene, then you, you will get the disease. And th there's only very low population, a small pop part of the population has that. And the gene has been uh, identified on these, on, uh, for this disease. And usually for this, for early onset or familial Alzheimer's disease, they, um, the, the beginning of, or, or onset of the disease is around like 50 years old or earlier. And the sporadic disease, Alzheimer's usually the size 60, 70, 80, or even older. And many of these, of the gene has been identified to, um, to contribute this sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Um, so this plot I would like to share with you is, is the current um, population. You can see what we have around here. Um, it's a population of Alzheimer's patients and it increased dramatically over time if, if we don't have any um, cure or uh, treatment for this disease. So currently it's like 5.2 million in, in the States and um, the number will be doubled or if, if not tripled over time in 2050 if, if um, the disease is not getting control. And currently it's about 1% of the GDP goes to the uh, caregiving of Alzheimer's patients. And if, <clears throat> as I say, in 2050, that could be, could reach $1 trillion. The single disease got to um, bankrupt the whole healthcare system. Um, so that's why it's, it's, it's a, a, now it's a national effort. Um, we have um, a lot of Alzheimer research um, including the NIH and also private sectors has a lot of um, fundings toward this disease because we try to find any, any treatment that can help the, not only the patients, but also the caregivers and the, and the economy. 
Um, Alzheimer's disease is a it's a multi I said, I said it's a it's, it's a multigenic disease. The, the reason I say it's multigenic is because most of the Alzheimer's disease patients, they are not having these three, APP, PS1, and personin 2 um, gene mutation on these three proteins. Majority of the patients does not have this mutation. They have the others, but the others, the other gene mutation on the other genes does not give, a, a hundred, give you 100% risk to get the, the disease. Um, so that's, that's multigenic. Each one contribute a little bit and then even, and also your, um, your age and also your, your living styles and exercise will contribute to the, to the, uh, the onset of the disease. Um, so this plot shows like the, uh, the frequency you see a very common ones are usually very low risk. As um, you probably heard of, it's called APOE4. Uh, this is, this is uh, um, the protein for the HDL, high density lipoproteins. So you probably heard about that with, with the cholesterol levels in your blood. So that's APOE4, this, is, this one is, is, a, is a high, High risk genes. If you have that, you will have you have like four times more chance to get Alzheimer's disease than the people does not have it. And then today, what I'm gonna talk talked about is a, a gene it's called TREM2. This is a, a gene found recently, um, not that recently now. It was like 2013 um, by uh, by two groups. They found this also. Uh, contribute a very high risk of Alzheimer's disease, even though they are very rare. And the, the genes I box out and also trying to, they are, they have an interesting um, common, common link to, they have a, a, common, a common place is because they are all um, expressed in myeloid cells or we say the um, immune cells. In the brain, there are majority, there are four type of, of the cells. Neuron is what all of us know. And then also three other types, they are, we, we call them glia. They are the supporting cells of, of the, uh, in the brain. And there's microglia, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. So neuron astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, they all come from, in, in, in the um, fetogenesis, they all come from the same, same um, resource. But microglia is actually different. Microglia is coming from outside of the brain. They are, they are actually um, resident micro, um, macrophages, which is uh, part of uh, one kind of white cells, white blood cells. But they uh, they migrate into brain when um, early in the fetal fetogenesis or neurogenesis and become part of the brain. And these microglia, as I say, it's a, it's called myeloid cells. is is a response to um, to immune responses. So what they the function of microglia or the job of microglia does every day is they survey the brain to look for if any, there's anything um, abnormal, if there's any uh, pathogen uh, invasion. And if that happens, it will respond to it and then eat them up. Or they will respond, they also will help to clean up the um, dead neurons and in, in the embryo or neurogenesis, they will actually help to, um, to fine tune the neuronal connection. They are very, um, this is a, 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 okay. So this is an image from, um, this is from, from a culture slice, brain slice. And you can see the white ones, these are individual microglia. And you, these are the processes of microglia, and you can see they uh, they generally they uh, they 
kind of like survey the area. They don't, the cell body is not moving, but they kind of extend their, um, their hands to, to touch the, uh, the surface to see if there's anything going on. And later on, you will see a, a beam of white, or like a white dot in the middle. It's a laser, it, it's a laser uh, light. So laser light burn out this area, and then we can see a micro gear move into that. Let's see. So you see the see this green dot, and then okay, all the micro gear extended their processes and also move in. So this is how they respond to the the one one kind of insult. Okay, so um, so. I, I think I showed you how the microglia goes to <clears throat> to that. Then, in the uh, Alzheimer's brain, the microglia responds to the amyloid plaque, which is, as I said, this, these are the signal plaques, um, the aggregates of amyloid beta. Their job is to respond to it, confine it, and then try to clean it up. As I mentioned before, in 2013, there are two papers back to back in the New England Journal of Medicine. It shows that the trend to, there is a very rare mutation, it's about 0.9% in the population, uh, Caucasian white. Um, they are, if they have that specific mutation, you, they had um, odds ratio to get Alzheimer's di disease to be two times to four times more than the, those one with the, with the norm, normal allele. And we know from the past, these genes only express in myeloid cells, in the brain is only in microglia. And if a complete loss of function, loss of this expression of this gene, it will result in the bone cyst and also white matter atrophy. But this is not Alzheimer's disease. It's just like, um, now we know it's, it's a partial loss of function of the trend, trend to leads to um, the male function of, of myeloid, of, uh, of microglia. Okay, so now we kind of know more about what's the function of the trend two. This is just a diagram to show how the trend two interact with different uh, proteins in, in the cells. But I want you to look at these boxes. Um, initially, we know they are they are response to the uh, inflammatory responses. And now we know they, they kind of promote phagocytosis. That means you eat, they can eat uh, the, the A-beta and, and other um, pathogens. And they also promote microglial survival. Uh, similarly, in, in the mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, if you take out the uh, knockout or trend to deficient microglia, then you can see how they respond to, to the plaque, which shows in green. So the red one is the is, uh, uh, microglia. You see when in the brain, if there are plaque shows in green, then microglia responds to it. So you kind of circle it up, responds to it, try to eat it up or somehow confine it. But in the in the trend to knockout mice, the microglia doesn't seem to respond to it very well. Okay, so that that indicates the trend to may play an important role in in microglia response to this kind of plaque. And we know the plaque could be the key to um, solve Alzheimer's disease. So the question we were asking was, okay. So, can we increase uh, trend to expression? And then can trend to expression increase will be neuroprotective against Alzheimer's disease. So what we did was to uh, introduce trend to into, uh, introduce an additional copy of trend to genes into the, into the mouse. By doing that, we can elevate the trend to expression in mice. And we'll see, then, then we, we um, just interrogate how these, how it, how they respond to the uh, Alzheimer's disease phenotypes. So we found they uh, they it responds to the plaque very well. They kind of you can see the green ones. These are the um, the plaques. 
they clear it better. So you have a reduction of the flag. T2 is a, a strong tool. So a reduction of the flag when the, when the mice overexpress or have more trying to express in the brain. And they also upregulate or increase microglial phagocytosis of the plaque. You can see that this is in the brain. You can see an increase of the, um, of the phagocytosis. Using, we're using the CD68, which is an indicator of, of the, um, of the phagocytic activity. We see an increase of that. And also we can see that in the, um, in the cell culture system, we also see the increased induction of the trend to uh, mediated increase of um, phagocytosis. And then the third one is we also, we saw a reduction of the dystrophic neurons. So you can see in the, the plaque in the middle, when, when neuron goes in, if there's a deposition of the plaque, then once the neurites goes in or in contact with it, it, be, it become dystrophic, meaning they are not happy, they are not healthy in, in that micro environment. So you will see a lot of the like dystrophic neurites shows up in red here. But with the, the upregulation of trend to expression, now we see a reduction of that. Here is the statistics. And this, not just the pathology or pathological improvement, we also see um, this is one kind of testing we, we did for, um, for memory test, uh, of course, in, in mouse. And they, they were, they call fear conditioning, meaning they put, they put into a contact, uh, basically it's a box. And underneath there are uh, grids they can see around it. They, re they remember what the book box looked like and the, the uh, pattern or the texture of the, uh, of the box. And then they were in there, but they got shot, electric shot, very mild, but it's enough for, to shock them, they remember. And so next time, uh, next day, they, when they bring into that box, because they remember, they will start to freeze. So that's how, how the freezing part comes in. So we, we measure the freezing. Um, that's meaning they, they know it and then they kind of scare about the, the box. But the uh, 5X FAD uh, is uh, one kind of um, Alzheimer mouse model. They, they see a reduction of freezing. That means they don't remember. They, they, they kind of are like wandering around. And so they don't remember. But when we introduce more trend to into into their brain, they they remember now. They so this is also helps them the, uh, another layer of, um, of of the proof that increased trend to level can help. This one I want to show you is you can see normally microglia response to a plaque. Now uh, now this in red microglia in green. You can see they respond to the plaque like that, very um, dramatic change coming from here, this kind to, to, the, to here. But if we, when we introduce TREM2 to, to, the, to the brain, they look like this a little bit, uh, they are not compared to the knockout, uh, TREM2 knockouts or TREM2 deficient microglia. It is different because they still respond to it, but they tend to be less, we call it angry looking or very, or very reactive looking. They still are surrounding it, respond to it more like a, a normal, not engaging, plug engaging microglia. But they tend to be able to handle the plug much better. And we, of course, we, um, the, the strength of the lab is, is a systems biology, so we, look at the, the whole panel of the gene expression in these mice. And, and then we identify these like trend to dependent gene cluster one and cluster two. And these shows up the, um, the trend to actually introduce a we call it repro reprogramming effect of the, of the microglia. And 
And uh, this is just a quick diagram to summarize what I have just been telling you. Normally, the TREM2, uh, TREM2 help the microglia to the response to the plaque and activate the microglia. But when you introduce uh, more TREM2 into the microglia, they tend to respond it better. They kind of confine the plaque even better with compared to the one without, with a normal amount of TREM2. And this is by, by different gene, set of gene expression. Um, so, and, oh, sorry. And this, this diagram, or this is a graph we actually are at, have a professional um, illustrator help us to, to illustrate this situation is normally when you are, think of that there's a, a, a bushfire and then your uh, microglia is your firefighter. So the, the, normally the firefighter is not as experienced and then with a small, small holes of, of the water pour in to try to, try to uh, extinct this fire. But then you have, if you have the trend to overexpression, that means you have the very well-trained and then full, uh, better equipped firefighter. And then you can see how big is the response of the water gets into the fire. So in light of our findings, um, there are actually already um, se several company and also, um, also um, academia lab been looking at into this. And so the first thing they, they did is trying to use antibody. You know, antibody is, they are not just like you can against um, the pathogens, but antibody can be used because they are very specific recognize certain patterns. So they can be used to uh, recognize the, activate the TREM2 or help to re reduce the trend to shedding, that meaning um, deletion of the, or, or eliminate the trend to. <clears throat> so both of these can help the trend to signaling goes down and then helps them to, um, for, for a beta clearance. And we also have the last bit is, uh, we also did the, the screening by ourselves uh, our approach is a bit different. We're doing that with a uh, um, small molecule approach. We want to use, uh, we, we did a screening and then try to look for the, the um, small molecules or compounds that can uh, help to increase trim to levels. Okay, I guess I am a little bit out of time. So I'll skip to this. You have, you've got like, you have like five, six minutes, so. Okay. Let me show you a very quick, this is a, another thing we're working on very actively. We call it morphologic analysis. This is a, a thorough approach to try to use morphological analysis and read out to, uh, for, for neuronal dysfunction. So this is just to show you, it's actually there are a lot of, even the neurons, we call it neurons, there are diff very many different types of neurons in the brain. And on top of that, we also have uh, glial cells I just introduced you. In normally, if a neuron look like this, during the neuron, neuronal um, insult or degeneration, you will start to see the neuron look like more like that. That is uh, the function of the neuron or health status of the neuron actually can be indicated by the, uh, the morphology of the neuron. So we aim to look at this uh, to, to see if we can use this as, uh, as a readout for, for, uh, for a disease. But the problem is when, when you do the standing to the, or look, try to look into individual neurons, there's almost no possible because the the neuron, the, the density of the neuron is very high. It's just like looking into a, a forest and then you cannot see which individual trees are, are sick. So in order to do that, we have to, we have to avoid like, to see everything, but we only see part of it, like sampling. 
and with uh with the method we build up now we can we can see the part of the new of the neurons is ranging about one percent to five percent of the neurons sampled sampled by by this method and um, we can de decide where when and what type of of the cells we want to see uh, just by genetic labeling and this is what it looked like just like there are some of some of the neurons being labeled and then you can see a very fine details of these like protein g cells and also the microglia, they, they can be looked individually and you can see the very fine processes. And we, can, we also can do a 3D reconstruction of that. And, okay, and at the end, I want to show you, this is the currently we can, our, our system, our platform can, um, can do a very thick section scanning and scan the whole brain this is only part of the 500 micron sections of the brain, just to show how, oh, sorry, how we can see the, the cells now. So you can see we fly into the brain and then you can see individuals one. These are about 2% of the, of the uh, cell neurons being, being labeled. It's not all the cells. If you label all the cells, you cannot see this kind of very individual one. And then we can we can even see how they connect. So one connect to the another. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, I would like to thank um, all the lab members. Um, I'm affiliated with William Yang staff in UCLA, and there's the other um, the people highlighted in other uh, in blue color or um, the people contribute to the research I've, I've been introducing. Okay, thank you. And um, I hope you learned something and then I'm, I'm waiting for the question. We can. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I actually, I should admit, um, I did see Dr. Yang present three or four years ago and you guys have made some like real intense progress. <laughs> um, I'm just, um, I'm super stunned. Um, so I guess one of the questions, um, is with the, um, with the morphology and being able to see, be able to label and see some of those neurons, like, what else can we do with that? I like, like, where, like, you know, what else can we, can we do with that kind of technology? So this is, um, for, for these technology, the, 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 Big point, picture, big like big picture of this technology is we can each individual neuron become a single data point. So usually when we do the study, we kind of like do overall, for example, overall neuronal activity, or we do a population wise to look at oh how how they look look how they perform as a population. But now we can look into individual cells, individual neurons, and also in, we can look into different types of neurons at the time. That meaning your, the study can be more robust and thorough, but with fewer animals in hand, just, for, just to, 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 to give you the same amount of the, of the data. And the other thing is, because we're looking at the um, morphology into this very fine detail, we are expecting to see uh, early changes in, in the morphology, which, which actually reflect to the, um, the cell status. Not, no matter it's microglia or neuron or astrocytes, the morphology change is one of the indication of how they, how they respond. So we're, we're, we're trying to look at that to, for the early signs and for, so this, this one will help in a lot in the uh, animal study. Awesome. Um, and then, okay, oh, um, so another question. How do you measure the stress that was given? Measure the what? The, the stress. So when you uh, were testing, yeah how, do you, like, how, yeah, how do you measure the stress? I, um, so that, that's a very interesting question. So. 
that's that's always always puzzles uh, animal researchers. Um, of course, you cannot. Well, well, I always like to say when we study the disease, the best model is human being. But the problem is you cannot do any tests on that that individuals, right? So we have to use surrogates, which is are the poor animals. They helps a lot. Um, but for for we always talking about the uh, um, conscious or the feeling. How how are you going to measure them? Um, it's it's always linked to the behavior we've been up observing the the mice or other bigger animals, how they respond to, for example, the stress that uh, you're asking or fear, um, or uh, or attention. So these these are these are things has been studied for decades, and so we kind of know what what the, what are the stress means. So for for the study I show it was it was uh, the fear and the memory. So you you know you know that they remember because you, you they show the fear kind of the of the expression. Yeah, I hope okay. that. No, thank you. Um, and then follow up question. Um. Sorry, multiple follow-up questions. So uh, how can you compare the stress given to animals with kind of like normal, like, you know, everyday human activities? The stress? Yeah, so like that fear stress response, like is how do you... There, there are actually methods to do uh, chronic stress. Uh, one, one very common, common um, method of, of use is actually, we call it booty test. So you actually have two, um, we have a bigger or older male mice, and then with another one, which, which are younger. So usually they are smaller. And the male mice, they, 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 um, they fight. If they are not grow up together, they come, they fight. So we put the, the, those two together, but, but not directly in contact. We have a, a small window, so they kind of like can contact each other in that sense. And, but they present over time, multiple days. So the, the, the smaller, weaker one being bullied. So that's, that's one kind of stress. And then we can measure that using other, other um, behavior testing to look at, for example, how they, when they go back to the home cage or explore the new, cage, new, new environment, how they respond to that. And when we next time introduce another new mice, not the, the, the old big bullied one, but the, uh, another neighbor, how do they respond? Do they still interact or they try to hide away? That kind of, that, that's that's uh, one way to assess the stress. But of course, there are man, many different methods. Um, and so, yeah, which actually, uh, um, so like it's, you know, you talked about it's, it's like hard to like measure the actual, like, you know, some sort of like level, if you will. But, you know, but I guess the key piece really is um, using the same stress each um, on each subject, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. There usually, usually this kind of testing, just like um, we asked. In the clean, we, we, all, we usually have multiple methods just to try to assess one, one uh, symptom. You, you cannot just use one to say that is right or not. You always have multiple, multiple results. Okay. Um, and, and so this, I mean, this next question is, um, you've shown a lot of great work from a large team. And as my colleague pointed out, because she, she has a PhD in microbiology, she was like, how does he have so many people? Um, and, um, but I guess, so in order for our teachers to share with students, um, I guess what are the skills that are like, you know, some of the, what are like the skills that like students would need to kind of like undertake this type of a project? Um, so I think you probably heard a lot, Mo most of the people, most of people in academia will tell you passion is the 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 core you 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 need. You probably don't. We every time we kind of like present these kind of things, 
those are days, years of work, and you you may you may only have part of the fun of the of the of the figures actually contribute by you. It's a it's a collaborative work, um, and there's a lot of time, just like fail and then you try again, then you try it again. So I think passion is is one of one of the key. Um, but the other thing is curiosity. You are, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't get to say what, when I, I was, I was very intrigued, intrigued by um, neurodegenerative disease because um, when, I was, when I was a young kid, my, um, my uncle has a car accident and then he, um, he paralyzed because of the accident. So since then, I started to kind of like very interested into the why, why these kind of things happening and then why cannot be reversed. And that's kind of bring me up to, so right now it's like, you're always looking for, for the things that's very interesting to you and then you, you um, pursue it. Awesome. And then one more question and we'll get to Michael. Um, so like, I guess, who's on your team? Cause you got a lot of people, um, you know, are there, you know, kind of a bunch of people with PhDs, but like, you have like, what are, you have lab technicians, data scientists you're working with. Um, I know some people, you know, partner with other labs to do, um, you know, if you're trying to do a gene knockout in a mouse, like, you know, sometimes your lab doesn't actually do it. You get someone else to do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, in the lab, we have, we have a few, um, senior scientists, which means they are already um, have their PhD, finish their um, postdoc training. Um, we also have uh, grad students. Currently uh, in the Alzheimer team, we have me and Xiaofeng, which is another um, party scientist and uh, one grad student. And in before pandemic, we actually have quite a few undergrad students. They um, they can they actually contribute very well to the to the to the uh, to the study. Yeah, and now we have one technician for the team. Awesome, thank you. And um, if you guys are in LA, last year I had last yeah last year. I had planned to do my LA event at UCLA at the Brain Research Institute. Um, and I'm actually really hoping to do that again uh, next spring. So maybe we can um, take a tour and see some of the really incredible machines that I've, uh, that someone else told <laughs> me that you have. They're, apparently they're amazing. Yeah, of course. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me, uh, Kimberly. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, some of the teachers out there in uh, Southern California. So here are my talking points uh, for my presentation. Uh, this is the agenda. I'll start my uh, STEM story by talking about what inspired me initially, what excites me today, and what my career tra trajectory has been uh, to get to my current position. I will then discuss my work and research in a little more detail, including environmental sciences, sustainability, and bio-inspired design. Next, I will describe the STEM skills and knowledge your students will need to be successful in my career field. I will touch on what teachers can do to support students interested in my career field or interested in Lockheed Martin. Finally, I will describe some of the many resources we have to support teachers as well as STEM outreach programs we have for students and teachers to explore research in my STEM field. For example, we support schools with virtual classroom speakers. We have STEM education programs. We do virtual job shadowing and are involved in a, a number of STEM outreach events. So does this make sense? This is um, exactly what I was asked to present. So hopefully understanding that quality means 100% conformance to requirements that this should be a quality presentation. So I will start off with my STEM story. So my STEM story begins with a, a lower middle class kid growing up in the 60s and 70s in Colton, California, the so-called hub city in the heart of the Inland Empire of Southern California, who 
who became aware of the pollution problem as a sophomore in high school and in a couple of different ways. First, I played four years of high school football and I can remember experiencing very painful and difficulty breathing during hell week at the end of summer, uh, getting ready for football season because of the smog, which was especially bad in my area due to the mountains, which tend to box in uh, the smog in uh, the Inland Empire. Second, uh, I can remember talking about the first Earth Day and the ecology movement in some of my classes uh, when I was in high school. It was then, about 1970, that I decided to pursue a career that would focus on fighting pollution. After high school, I attended UCR, UC Riverside, and majored in environmental sciences which was one of the very first universities to offer such a degree. With strong roots in ag science, UCR researchers were the first to study pesticide and smog impacts on plants. And so eventually the statewide air pollution research center was located at UCR and Dr. James Pitts uh, led that center. Uh, uh, and you can see Dr. Pitts uh, in the upper left photo uh, showing then Governor Ronald Reagan what smog does to the lungs. My professor, Dr. Pitts, was the first to figure out how smog is formed in the atmosphere. And then uh, much later in my career, I received a master's degree in environmental and occupational uh, health from uh, Cal State University, Northridge. I feel blessed to have been able to both start and end my career doing what I like best, and that is applied research in the environmental field. I have 42 years of experience in the environmental field and started out my career working for TRW as a chemist in their environmental laboratory and then moved to uh, become a field technician where I worked on projects for US Environmental Protection Agency to identify and evaluate the types of air pollutant emittance from steel foundries, power plants, and copper smelters. The top left picture is a picture that I took while at Kaiser Steel in Fontana while we were sampling for benzene emissions from their Coke ovens. The picture below that is the one I took while at TRW's lab in 1979. I then moved to a technical staff position, writing reports on the fate and transport of pollutants and pesticides in the air, water, and soil for US EPA. Key lessons learned for me at TRW were how to write a good research paper and technical report and how to carefully follow analytical methods. Then I got a job as an environmental control specialist working for Lockheed Aircraft Service Company in Ontario. Some of my most important learn, uh, learn by doing occurred there. And that's, you can see me there on the bottom right photo, trying to identify various hazardous wastes that were left out in drums on the wash rack for many years before I got there. Also had a lot more hair back then too. <laughs> Key lessons learned for me at Lockheed Aircraft Service Company included the value of well-written procedures training, and cost accountability, as well as working with shop floor employees. I got my first manager position at General Dynamics Space Systems in San Diego, which is now part of Lockheed Martin. And that's me in the upper right photo at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, uh, Space Launch Complex number 36. The key takeaway while at General Dynamics was learning the value of senior management leadership and support. From there, I went to work for Allied Signals Aerospace Headquarters in Torrance, California, where I was responsible for managing the environmental program 
for 26 divisions of the company at over 100 factory locations around the world. This was the shortest position I've ever held, getting burned out from all the travel in just two and a half years. In 1992, I began working for Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, and I've been there ever since. And that kind of leads to my current work and research, but uh, sorry about that. I guess you did not see. I didn't notice I had some animation there, so you missed that one photo anyway. Before going there, I just wanted to say that a part of my STEM story is that on the personal side, I'm a huge science geek, Star Wars fan, and Disney fan. Yes, that's me with Bill Nye, the science guy in the center there. We spoke together in the same session at the very first Green Schools Conference in Pasadena. Also, of course, I have a big love for nature, which is kind, kind of leads into what I'm doing today. The bulk of my current role at the Skunk Works is managing our sustainable design program. And much of what I'm going to share about uh, the program will come from a presentation I gave for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, who asked me to address the following question. How are aerospace engineers and scientists integrating sustainability considerations and priorities into new product development and business innovation? In this segment, I will provide an overview of our sustainable design program, which seeks innovative, sustainable solutions to the Skunk Works design and technology challenges to both improve product performance and reduce environmental and human health impacts. As some of you may know, the Skunk Works is the front end of Lockheed Martin aeronautics company's line of business. We are responsible for new program pursuits, technology development and derivatives to existing platforms. We, we help customers solve their most difficult challenges to successfully accomplish critical defense missions. Over the past few years, we have won several major new programs which require the development of incredibly challenging materials and technology advancements, including hypersonics, next generation air dominance and air mobility, as well as special mission aircraft like the X-59 low boom flight demonstrator for NASA. Because the greatest design opportunities are always material and energy limited, we are having to develop new approaches to innovation that will result in more sustainable solutions and depart from the typical approach to problem solving. Lockheed has, has always maintained a very strong pollution prevention program for the past 20 years. Um, our focus for most of that time was on basic material substitution. For example, removing chromium and toxic solvents from our coatings. In 2018, we re revised our strategy and rebranded the program. The mission of the sustainable design program now is to spark innovative sustainable solutions to technology product and operational challenges to both improve performance and reduce environmental and human health impacts. The sustainable design program focuses on proof of concept seedling projects that have environmental benefits that are aligned with the company's technology roadmap. The sustainable design program projects fall into five basic categories. One, using bio-inspired design and engineered biology to solve key design challenges. Using advanced technology such as plasma, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. 
focusing on renewable energy technologies and energy density challenges for aircraft, replacing chemical substances that are being restricted by the US and international regulatory agencies. And last, implementing go green projects that focus on reducing waste, water, and energy consumption. The Skunk Works has a strong interest in renewable energy technologies such as nuclear fusion. The, <clears throat> we've been working on nuclear fusion for the, for the past uh, five plus years. And we recently broke ground on a 24 megawatt expansion to our one megawatt solar farm. So what is biomimicry or bio-inspired design? Bio-inspired design is an approach to innovation using nature's time-tested structures and functions at every scale from nano to macro and at every level from simple form to ecosystem to solve engineering challenges. Nature always selects the most material and energy conserving solutions. And from a survival standpoint, nature always makes sustainable use of the periodic table, avoiding elements that are toxic to living systems, thus leading to more sustainable designs. Bio-inspired design can also shorten the product development cycle, for example, from the publication of the first research paper on soft-bodied robotics to the establishment of the first company producing soft robots was less than two years. According to one study over 25, of over 25,000 research papers, as you can see in the graph, Bio-inspired design in the materials and engineering fields has grown exponentially over the past decade. Again, because new design opportunities are always material and energy limited, we believe that learning from nature will open up the design space in many critically important technology threads within Lockheed Martin. Over the past few years, we have brought in the world's leading consultancies and universities to train hundreds of Lockheed Martin engineers and scientists on how to do bio-inspired design. <clears throat> we also use them to identify key organisms whose biological functions can inspire important solutions to design challenges in the areas of optics and photonics, aerodynamics, thermal management, and structural materials. And you can see some example species uh, there that um, Professor Jacqueline Noggle from James Madison University in Ohio had uh, provided to us. Although I can't go into a lot of detail regarding our bio-inspired design work, um, I want to show you some examples of the types of projects we are managing and some of the organisms we are taking inspiration from. As you can see here, a wide variety of bio-inspired design studies have been explored, ranging from fungus-based biodegradable materials to aerodynamics work inspired by the owl feather to optical sensors and structural colors inspired by beetles and butterflies, to lightweight multi-purpose structures inspired by bird bones and the sea sponge. We have seen growing customer interest in several of the bio-inspired design technologies we are working on. Army, Navy, and Air Force customers are particularly enthusiastic about engineered biology and bio-inspired materials. So the next segment is to answer the question, what STEM skills and knowledge do I actively need to be successful in my job as a, a green professional? So 
behavioral rather than technical competencies distinguish superior from average performance. This according to a, a uh, one of the most famous and largest studies of the um, environmental profession um, that I've ever seen. Success in the environmental role is not just technical, but how the environmental expert communicates his or her expertise to others, how the information is framed and the strategies employed to gain credibility with others. Interpersonal tends to be less important in other technical profession, professions, um, like maybe Professor Lee's, uh, the ones he just talked about. But the environmental profession is unique, complex, and demanding. But starting with technical skills, which are really foundational, I recommend the following courses that you can see on the screen there. The green career field is is broader than it has ever been. And students can focus in on many different areas these days. Researchers like Dr. James Lehman from uh, 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 I'm forgetting the university he's at actually now. Uh, Dr. Lehman defined 15 cognitive, interpersonal, and intrapersonal behaviors that account for green career professional success. Dr. Lehman also identified three failure behaviors, and these are things like avoiding conflict, using the moral higher ground, and being inflexible. All those behaviors lead to poor performance. And these are things you should. Uh, talk to your students about. Starting with cognitive competencies, problem solving skills are absolutely critical for those entering this field. Identifying the causal relationships, often through the use of a chain of inferences, which is you know, basically inductive reasoning, as well as conceptual thinking, solving problems, or identifying solutions by recognizing and organizing the information into either an existing concept or an invented concept. That's deductive uh, Sherlock Holmes type reasoning. Information seeking is also very important. Desiring to know more, to seek out and discover all the information. I can't tell you how many times I've made my staff go back and collect additional data because they've, you know, come up with a solution without really understanding everything that's going on. Also, asking many questions, probing for satisfactory answers, and tending to explore not only an individual's thoughts and opinions, but also identifying the facts and distinguishing fact from opinion. These are all important for conducting audits, for doing research and hazard identification. Finally, planning, using a planning model or a systematic method with, with a planning process uh, creates an organized approach and result in a clear path of action. As previously suggested, behavioral rather than technical competencies distinguish superior from average performance. Success in the environmental role also includes a number of interpersonal competencies. Uh, I'm just highlighting a few of them here, networking, involving others in problem identification, solution generation, and implementation by identifying the right stakeholders to involve and then involving them actively in the process. This is why project management or, or uh, project type uh, work uh, at the student level is critically important to build those skills. Building and maintaining friendly relationships or contacts with people who are or might someday be helpful in achieving work-related goals. Also building a rapport with others, as well as actively pursuing and maintaining a wide breadth of contacts to deepen the effectiveness of his or her network. Um, and then 
Uh, finally, for interpersonal um, effective writing, using your ABCs, accuracy, brevity, and clarity. Uh, you know, we just don't have time in industry uh, for a lot of fluff. We, we want the answer and we want it stated very simply. Um, Uh, and then finally, intrapersonal competencies. These are things that we try to pick up on during the interview process. Uh, achievement orientation, perseverance, self-control, integrity, common sense. These are also very important. As Yoda would say, control, you must learn control. Okay, so other advice. Uh, know yourself, what you want, what you're good at, be flexible, open to new experiences, expand your computer skills, critically important today, uh, programming, modeling, GIS, uh, you know, that's important for the student to pick up as many computer skills as possible. Uh, keeping up with the latest environmental trends, there's a, a good website I included there. Uh, generalizing uh, is good, but choose a couple areas to really focus on in your student career. Getting certifications, advanced degrees as soon as practical. And then most important, real word, world experiences, internships, co-ops, uh, job shadowing. These are all very important uh, things for students to get on their resume. And another thing to keep in mind is the job descriptions for when your students graduate from college haven't even been written yet. So keep an open mind. Okay, so what can teachers do to support students interested in my career field or organization? Start by letting them know green careers are, very, are in very high demand because of expanding global regulations. I mean, you see it on the news every day, right? Growing uh, resource consumption, increasing scrutiny uh, and societal expectations for corporations, uh, chemical liability, and then of course the big one, climate change. Another thing you can highlight for students um, is that uh, the average uh, salary for uh, a green career is slightly higher than a lot of other science uh, fields. And it also is uh, in higher demand, as you can see here. And in particular, sustainability is drawing top dollar and top students from around the country. Uh, and there are lots of uh, programs, university programs that, uh, the uh, bachelor's and master's and PhD level that um, are now focused on sustainability. Finally, another thing you can do is to actually teach biomimicry in the classroom. Most major universities have some sort of biomimicry or bio-inspired engineering course. Um, introducing biomimicry into the classroom bridges the boundaries between school and the real world for students. Biomimicry is an inherently interdisciplinary way of encouraging students to be observant of the complexity of the natural world and our interconnectedness to it. Rather than just to learn about living things, biomimicry requires us to learn from the natural world. Uh, the Biomimicry Institute has been the leader in bio-inspired design information, and their website contains a wealth of information on the subject. And I've, I have a bunch of links that um, you all can have. Um, their YouTube channel has really super excellent quality videos geared to high school students. Um, and they have a partnership with EcoRise to deliver curriculum. Uh, for high school um, students. Uh, it might be junior high as well. I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, nature's strategies challenge chemistry, physics, and biology students to look at nature as a mentor in order to solve sustainability challenges. 
Um, and one of the key things you can do is to use the Ask Nature tool as a field guide to the natural world. Uh, designed to draw the student's eye to whatever we can learn from nature, not just what we can learn about nature, but learn from them. The Ask Nature site recently received a major overhaul and now consists of four main sections, biological strategy uh, with over 1800 profiles of species, uh, innovations, um, uh, other successes, uh, successful case studies. Uh, now, uh, what's new is educational resources, tools for teachers and students to learn about and begin practicing biomimicry. And then fourth, collections, which are thoughtful essays that identify a theme, trend, or pattern emerging amongst biological strategies. Another thing I would point to is I just got finished judging the Youth Design Challenge. This is put on by the Biomimicry Institute. These are for these are teams of high school kids around the world uh, that do hands-on project-based learning uh, that provides uh, classroom and informal educators with engaging, really engaging framework to introduce bio-inspired design and, inter, and that interdisciplinary lens on science engineering and environmental literacy. Um, the picture on the lower left is uh, one of the uh, best done projects by uh, a high school team out of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and they're looking at uh, a, a design inspired uh, from a couple of different species to, <clears throat> to reduce um, damage to estuaries from um, wave action from, you know, violent storms, which are becoming more of the norm because of climate change. And so not only reducing the damage, uh, uh, wave damage, but also providing habitat for, for certain species that live in that area. So that was a really excellent uh, job that they did. Also included a link to the Center for Learning with Nature. Uh, they also have some excellent curriculum for um, K to 12, actually. All right, so last question, um, STEM resources. How am I doing on time? I got just a few minutes left, okay. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so I have a bunch of stuff. Um, all of these you can find on the Lockheed Martin, you know, LockheedMartin.com website. You may be familiar with um, a number of these um, and Lockheed participates in all of them. Uh, I would highlight CodeQuest, um, a computer programming competition that put high school students coding skills to the test. Um, and uh, also would, would highlight engineers in the classroom. Every February is engineers month and uh, we send uh, engineers out into the classrooms to mentor and, and give uh, kids advice on careers in the STEM fields. Um, First Robotics is a great program. There's, there's uh, in the Antelope Valley and Santa Clarita Valley, they're, uh, those robotics teams do excellent work and are very competitive. Um, so the link to the corporate Lockheed Martin website is here. We also have a, a neat uh, career predictor, um, which is pictured here um, and the links here. Um, you know, you answer a bunch of questions and, and the computer will tell you what kind of career might be of interest to, you, to your students. Uh, Kimberly, how am I doing on time? I have 5.20 as my stop. Um, yeah, we got a couple more minutes. Sorry, that's my bad. I was stopped paying attention to the time because I was very interested in your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, I'll go for, I think I got like maybe five minutes left here. So I'll uh, try to quickly go through this, um, the rest of the content. So. Um, 
STEM outreach. Um, we do a lot locally in, in the areas in which Lockheed Martin um, has facilities. So for example, Marie Weber, who's I think on, on, on the line here uh, in there's Lockheed Martin facilities in her area in Maryland, and uh, they do a lot of STEM outreach there. And then for us at the Skunk Works, we do a lot of outreach to the Antelope Valley, Palmdale, Lancaster, as well as the Santa Clarita Valley, where we also have some facilities. We support a couple of nonprofits there, and they do a lot of green career type um, and environmental um, education. Things like for Meek, uh, the Enviro Bus Bucks, where they sponsor a, a bus, pay for a bus so that your class can go visit some environmentally themed area or visit at an industrial site and see what they're doing to prevent pollution. Mini grants, both Meek and Seek uh, offer teacher mini grants. And uh, so the, the curriculum I talked about um, that's available from Biomimicry Institute, for example, it's 250 bucks. Well, that would be a perfect mini grant for a teacher and you can apply on, on these websites. We have a number of annual events and contests for Meek and Seek. Um, we do scholarships. Um, and then the big one for, for me is Green STEM Summit, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Uh, also, I have, um, because of COVID, I, I uh, had our team put together um, some virtual jobs shadowing videos um, that are on different green careers, like air, an air quality specialist or hazardous material specialist and so on. If you're looking for a quick five or six minute video, these are all publicly um, releasable. Um, just shoot me an email and... Uh, uh, we can uh, coordinate on getting, uh, providing those videos for you to use in your classroom. And we, and we do uh, other thing, well, uh, like uh, Valencia High School's nanoscience poster competition. And we, we just, we do other things that I don't have time to mention. But the, here's the list of the different topics um, uh, for virtual job shadowing. This is the Green STEM Summit. This, this is held every October. And we invite, uh, last year we had 90 STEM professionals, uh, a majority female, uh, you know, uh, more than a third were PhDs from industry, academia, government. And they talked about uh, natural and physical sciences, biomimicry, engineering, environmental, advanced manufacturing. Uh, a whole bunch of things. Uh, you can see the student responses. Um, it went over very well. Um, and it's doing its job um, inspiring STEM careers. And just a couple of charts to show you the kinds of 15-minute presentations that were done. Quite a variety of, of STEM topics. Uh, the theme being, you know, uh, using STEM to make a greener world. So there's two pages to it and, and students can, can pick and choose. And the videos from all of these from last year are available on the SEEK website. That's my story. That's my STEM story, I should say. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we, have, uh, we do have some questions, um, but first, and I mentioned this to Marie, is so I've, act I've actually seen like, I think you're the at least fifth Lockheed Martin presentation I've seen this year, um, and I got us. And I'm just really enjoying the diversity of presentations. You know, so we had you. We've had someone talk about lasers, cybersecurity. Marie talked about uh, systems engineering, uh, and we actually we ended up did have an aerospace engineer talk about helicopters for a bit. But I mean, I'm just really it's Lockheed Martin just does so much stuff. More of a comment from my side. And then, so for a couple of questions, one question we have is, I guess someone was interested in, um, do any of those STEM grants reach down to like the Long Beach Unified School District? If you go to, well, uh, some of the, the local ones don't, but um, if, you, if you are looking for funds for something in the LA area, go to the LockheedMartin.com website and, and then uh, under STEM activities, um, you can click on cyber grants 
and 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 you can apply for a grant that way. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then all right, let's see what we got for other questions. And I guess so what's your favorite, I guess, like biomimicry that you've seen at Lockheed Martin? Oh, that's a good question. I would say my favorite is just because of the species itself, the work we did to reduce propeller noise for unmanned aerial vehicles inspired by the uh, owl feathers. Uh, the, 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 both the leading edge and trailing edge of an owl, uh, of an owl's wing has little tiny vortices that um, create or little tiny, I, I guess, um, little triangles, I would say, that create vortices in the air that reduce drag. And they also reduce sound levels. So if you have ever seen an owl in flight, you don't hear them. No. <laughs> Just the work we did to reduce propeller noise was was probably my favorite project. Oh, that's really interesting. I did see it on the chart and I was like, I wonder how that works. <laughs> In terms of how do you see, um, you, you mentioned kind of like the problem solving critical thinking skills. How do you see that playing out in your work? Uh, well, every day is a challenge. In this, in the environmental field, if you're working for uh, industry, if you're working for government, if you're working in academia, uh, doing research, I mean, every day is a challenge and every day you're, you, you're faced with a new problem. And just having a good set of problem solving skills is just really important. In, uh, in industry, we, we do root cause analysis training for our employees so that they can, you know, get to the root cause of, of whatever problem they're dealing with. And so it's just something you've got to have in your toolbox to, to do a good job. Because like I said, every, every day there's a new problem <laughs> you got to go figure out. So. I guess along that theme, then, what was your what was the your most favorite problem you saw, you've solved? Well, the biggest challenge for me was, you know, three is kind of related to my STEM story, and and that's like uh, four years ago, my boss said you need to go figure out a way to make engineers and scientists think sustainability and think about the environment when they're designing new products. So, you know, how do I go do that? I mean, you know, the younger generations are pretty much, you know, they grew up on recycling and all that. So they're pretty enthusiastic, but how do you teach those old dogs new tricks? <laughs> so when I found out about biomimicry, it was like, aha, it was like my aha moment. Like, um, here's something that everybody loves, you know, nature and organisms and, you know, what they do. And, and maybe not only can we like, uh, uh, imitate nature to make us more sustainable, but can nature teach us to solve some of these incredible challenges that we have technology wise? And so it caught on like wildfire at, at our company and it was a way to, to really change the culture at our facility. That's oh. kind of the biggest problem. <laughs> no, but that's super interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I was on, um, well, I was on the internet earlier today and I saw someone had posted a picture and it was something, it was, it was about how nature is all about efficiency. Um, yeah, yeah. Serendipitous that, you, that I saw to see <laughs> this presentation today. Um, and with that, because we are at 8.30, um, I have one more slide to share with everyone and then I'll let y'all go. Because I'm sure you know people are busy and have things going on. So I can. I really want to thank uh, Michael Haro and Dr. Daniel Lee for presenting today um, and sharing just really fascinating information. Um, I also need to thank our sponsors who bring well when we do in-person events, uh, which I'm actually very excited to go go see some faces next year. You know, when we do in-person events um, and all of the resources, uh, we do all of this for free for you guys, and we you know certainly could not do that without the help of our sponsors and. For this event, our sponsors are the Akamai Foundation, Amgen Foundation, Boeing, Hologic, KLA Corporation, Illumina Foundation, Infineon, Jacobs Engineering, Lockheed Martin, Nordson, Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research, PC Energy, Vulcan Materials, and Westrock. Um, so all you teachers, uh, please, if you, you know, I know you're wrapping up the school year, but if you need some exciting activities, please let me know. I'm happy to look some stuff up for you, uh, send you what I can find. I'm here to help uh, however I can.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kimberly. Thank you very much. I gotta figure how I end it. <laughs> Great job. Yeah, are you ending the recording? Um, yeah, I am, but actually. Mm -hmm.